All right, so uh, this is Power Season 4, Episode 3. Um, it start off with the feds starting to crack down on uh, ghost associates. And the first thing they do is uh, they, ra- they grab up Dre and bring him in for questioning to see if he could break, see what, he, what beans he going to spill, you know. Next is Julio. They come and grab up Julio, see if he going to break, see if he going to turn in anything on Ghost, see what he got to say. They even take down Keisha fine ass to see what she got to say about Tasha, Ghost, Tommy, whatever. They trying to wrap them all up. Then into the picture is Greg's best friend that he was talking to from Homeland Security. He comes to Greg's funeral and he sees Angie there. And damn, is he pissed. Now they cut to Ghost. He's locked up. And then in come walk this smooth looking brother. And Ghost is wondering, who the fuck is this dude? And then turns to find out that's his new lawyer. You know, Ghost's uh, case is getting out of hand and a little too much for Proctor to ha- handle on his own. So he calls in some help. You know, he trying to make this like the OJ case or something. He need a super lawyer defense team for his ass. And so Ghost, you know, he's starting to realize, damn, I'm in deep shit. I need, uh, Proctor need help to handle this. So hopefully he worth the, worth, worth the help that he hired. Now Proctor comes in and they've been talking for a minute and they tell Ghost, hey, go through the night in question again. Tell us what happened. He said, man, we did this all right. They say, hey do it again we need to make sure we got all angles covered they show him the pictures and things that they have laid out he looks through the pictures he notices a couple things out of place but that's pretty much as far as it go they say hey that sounds good this and that but that's gonna be hell and high water to prove um the one thing that i always wonder is when greg was killed why did they never review the videotapes of who entered his building. This is New York City. I'm sure just like in most cities with nice apartment buildings, um, it's got to be some type of camera system there. When when uh, Sandoval came there to uh, kill him, he just received a regular phone call. He didn't come there with the intentions of killing him. He didn't expect to kill him. He walked through the front door. Now, as far as ghosts, he came through the fire escape. So he never would have been on video camera footage coming into the building. Whereas Mike walked through the front door. That would have been going with the the time of death. When they did the autopsy, they would have known the time of death. They would have known that, hey, he died at this time. At that time that he was pronounced dead, Ghost had an alibi. He was at the club already. And we'd have to review the tapes to see who entered in and out of the building and narrow down our search. They would have saw Mike came in the building, and then he would have been busted. But I guess, hey, if they would have did that, it would have been no series season four. (laughs) And so I guess they had to do something to keep the show going, right? Now, the way that the last episode left off was Ghost making a call to Tommy saying, hey, take care of my family. So now here they go showing Tommy trying to be in the role of Ghost, dropping off the kids at school, trying to give them a little pep talk trying to say, hey, you know, your dad cares about you. He wouldn't do this. He wouldn't do that. Tariq starting to let the brainwash leak out, telling him, hey, you know, F my dad, F this, F that. You know, I don't care about the family or whatever the case. And, you know, even though he may not have had all them F bombs, you could tell it in the way he was talking. It was implied. And so Tommy is looking a little confused like, damn, this ain't Tariq. I remember. Who the hell is this kid now? Now they're trying to show Sax, you know, trying to beat beat whatever little information he can out of Julio and Dre and questioning them and seeing what, what he can get out of them. And they both pretty much have the same story that, hey, he looked out for us when he didn't have to. He, he, he trying to look out, bring people that, you know, got mess ups in their life and make good out of them, you know, and uh, they, they wouldn't leak, you know, and spill the beans for nothing and so they are both looking like damn uh what are we gonna do now none of the witnesses even Keisha didn't talk so now what do we got left what is our angle left and so uh they end up hearing about Cantos but they ain't ready to move on that yet because it could easily be said hey this guy is uh, a disgruntled employee 
So they don't know what to do right now. And they, they kind of left holding the bag of nothing right now. The one thing they did do different, though, with Keisha is they tried to have Angie interview her. And you could, you know, cut the tension with a knife in the room. And, you know, Keisha just want to whoop her ass the whole time because she know that Angie part of the reason all of this happened from the get go. And the questions she ans asking Keisha and things of that matter, she already knows that Angie knows the answer. And it must be something that she's trying to do or some type of slick shit. And so she tries her best not to say nothing incriminating. But even though she tries, she may make a slip up here or there. But nothing too obvious. But in the long run, it, it may end up hurting Keisha and the family um, as well. Now they back at Keisha's house with the two lawyers and they're trying to get the rundown on what the attorneys was asking, what that may mean, trying to understand the angles that the, the, the prosecutors may be trying to come at them at. And then that's when they find out, hey, you know, by you saying certain things, they may try to try to say that. You know, they not necessarily husband and wife, but business partners. And then they might try to put her on the stand and, you know, basically force her to testify against ghosts or they can, you know, prosecute her and take her kids and family away. So, you know, they trying to put uh, Tasha between a rock and a hard place. And, uh, you know, Keisha thought she was helping, but she don't know if she really hurt or helped that situation or not. You know, the shit's really starting to hit the fan and, you know, Tasha's starting to feel that crunch. And so is Keisha now. And so is the lawyers now. Now they show the old school OG white gangster and uh, he get a special pack of ramen noodles. And uh, within that special pack of ramen noodles, he gets a little more information about Ghost and Tommy. And uh, I thought he might have been Tommy long lost daddy. Turns out he don't give a shit about them. He looking at them as a way to get money for his old wife. And, uh, you know, you can see Ghost in the background. And uh, that's what he got his eye on the whole time is trying to get some of that money. He figured they rich. I can try to frame them, do whatever, um, whether it's, you know, legit or not. Who gives a shit? It's this. He's swinging for the fences. You know, it's like the home run derby. He trying to get it all. So let's see what he can do. Now they're showing Mock and his crew and he's learning that damn nobody testified. Nobody broke. And not only did nobody broke, he liked the ghetto fucking Robin Hood of the hood. <laughs> so, damn, what can we do? Who knows? We're going to have to keep looking. Angie, what do you think? You think he did it? She thinks he did it. I don't know how. She never saw him commit a crime or do any of that stuff. He never confessed to her he did. But she thinks he did it. And, you know, they're going to pursue it. Now, Tommy is getting stressed from all angles. Um, he not used to being the main man. He not being used to being the one making all the decisions. And it's starting to stress him out. He getting stressed from his new business partner. Who's getting stressed from Chicago. He getting stressed from having to be the main decision maker. He don't have ghosts with him. It's starting to just stress Tommy out. And he ain't built for this, really. Now the heat is getting cranked up. Ghost daughter is at school. She getting a little text from on a little pink eye, a little iPhone about her daddy and how he going to get death penalty. She's stressed out, ready to cry. And then Tariq walks up and, well, actually, these bullies walk up and try to tease her. And then Tariq walks up and don't make any matters worse. And this little punk, he ought to be ashamed as big as he is trying to come and tease her. He actually get what he deserved from Tariq. Tariq, as you can see, he come and yoke his ass up, put the little evil eye in his motherfucking face. He had to close his eyes. He was so scared. He put the fear in his ass. That little boy, I don't think he going to be teasing her no time soon unless he know Tariq ain't in school because Tariq kind of stared through his soul with that one. After that, 
Tariq, he handled it in his own way. He leave. He tell him, tell the office I'm sick. I'm out. And she chased him outside the school saying, wait, wait, let me talk to you. And she stressed out. You know, she a little girl. She going to cry about it. Tariq, he mad. He going to go and, you know, do whatever. He looking at his little mentor, 50 Cent, for his help. And so she crying outside. Little does she know it's paparazzi everywhere taking pictures and this and that. And they couldn't wait to get this picture of her crying outside just to put a big headline around it and make it a big story you know the news cycle of today they always looking for a new story something new to sell papers or email hits i mean emails or you know website clicks or whatever the case and uh this this case is just the same in new york so you know she's stressing right now and she don't know how the shit's gonna hit the fan because of this but it ain't her fault in the end she didn't do nothing wrong you know she a kid and she's stressing now they got ghost lawyers meeting with him again, trying to rediscuss the night in question and whether the pullover that he said happened with Greg did or did not actually happen. He's saying it did happen and uh, he's saying that the DNA was planted. And then, you know, the wheels start turning and they starting to think, well, maybe if we find this night of this pullover, this proof, then maybe we can get the DNA evidence thrown out or something because, hey, maybe he got DNA on his body because he pulled him over and, you know, was touching all on him. And maybe it's not DNA because it was a struggle, as the, D the, the prosecution implies. Maybe it was DNA from other means. And so, they, you know, they wheels is turning, trying to think of all angles to get saved ghost ass. Now they brought in Greg's friend for questioning. And he's talking to, you know, uh, Mike. And he's uh, talking to their legal de team, team and uh, Mock. And he's telling them his theory. He's telling them about the evidence he has and what Greg told him and how, you know, Greg had, a, a, you know, evidence thinking that Angie was the leak and that, uh, you know, all these other different little angles and theories that they didn't think of. And they're saying, well, hey, man, we, we can't prove this or prove that. But uh, what difference does it make? We want to get St. Patrick in jail. What difference does the story make? And he's saying it makes a big fucking difference. I don't want Greg to go down as a crooked cop. He wasn't a crooked cop. You need to go ahead and clear his name, say that he wasn't a crooked cop, and that, you know, give him his rights and his burial and all of that stuff that he deserves. And at the same time, you arrest the right people. You don't just, you know, throw him and his name in the mud. And even though you may get the right people or what have you, it, it still makes him look bad in the process. That's not the type of dude he was. That's not right. And they saying, well, we don't know if we could do all that. And he's saying, well, you know, fuck you. I can't help you. And he walks away. Now they show Tommy talking to Keisha about what's going on, about, you know, the, the feds, you know, pulling her in for questioning and how she talked to the lawyers at Keisha House and, you know, all the shit that's going on and Tommy looking at that ass while he eating Chinese food, knowing damn well he want to eat some filet of fish in this motherfucker. <laughs> but anyway, he trying to reassure her, hey, it's all good. Don't stress about that. I got your back. And don't worry about Tasha. She ain't no snitch. And she thinking, well, if they try to put her between her kids and us, man, she going to give us up. And she's saying, nah, Tasha ain't going to do that. And, you know, the lawyers and Proctor, they ain't going to make sure they they're going to make sure that, that they don't get Tasha in that situation. So stop stressing. We're going to be good. You're going to be good. Don't worry, baby. I got you. Now, come on and sit on my lap. Now they show Tariq talking to his little mentor, 50 Cent, with a bowl of plastic fruit on the table. Damn, that shit is old school. I didn't even know they still had that made for people. Hey, who puts that on their damn table? That's so goddamn tacky. Who? What is the point of that? But anyway, that's like so 70s, 80s. Uh, so Tariq, he getting his little advice from his big brother, you know, the, the Grand Wizard 50 Cent, a.k.a. Kanan, uh, a.k.a. Slim. And he making him some more lean, getting him under the influence, about to shake him up a little batch of juice, get right juice. And uh, he got this big plan, Kanan. He, he's so fucking smart. And he going to get Tariq involved in this big plan. And uh, wait till you see what this fucking plan is, man. It's just <laughs> it's so crazy. I can see why Ghost didn't want to be under him and had to get him set up. Because he a small-minded individual. He think he's so fucking smart. And it's always 
these people that think they're so smart, but in the end, they're very small minded and they it's hard for them to listen. They don't understand. And he think what his plan is and what he's trying to do is like going to get him to the top. And he's just a damn fool. Now, Angie is confronted by Greg's boy and Greg's boy looking at her like you fucking bitch. You didn't got my boy killed. If it wasn't for you dumping him for St. Patrick and then getting twisted up and all this shit and then making Greg want to go crazy to, you know, try to, you know, nab you, you both of you, you know, he would still be alive today. And, you know, Greg thought that she was the mole. And it wasn't until the night that he died when he got the call from the Federales that he realized that it was Mike that's the mole. Because Mike is the only one that could have lied about that information of the Federales and from Mexico and, and lied about sending them to the wrong place. Angie's the one that came up with the right location. And that's when he put two and two together. But like a fucking Boy Scout that he is, he just couldn't hold it back. He just had to tell Mike to his face that he knew. He just couldn't wait. If he would have just waited and waited till he could tell everybody else and the next day he could have actually had him. But he had to tell him when there was nobody else there and, you know, Mike executed him. But nevertheless, uh, the last person he talked to was his boy and he was telling his boy he was so sure it was Angie. And so his boy, that's the last thing he remembers is Mike just you know swore he i mean greg swore that it was angie and then the next thing you know he's dead so in his mind it was angie that was the mole and angie had uh saint patrick kill him you know to, to to cover everything up and so you know he's confronting angie with that and saying hey if you care so much about greg turn your punk ass in go to jail let St. patrick get the needle and let greg get his name cleared and she like wait a minute i ain't involved in all of that i didn't do that and just like she don't believe ghosts he don't believe her and so now she kind of she don't understand that that's how ghost feels exactly but she do kind of understand how he feels now they show Andre and he got the girls, you know, taking out the matches and putting in the pills in the matchbook, you know, because he got that little bottle service, you know, going where that if they order somebody order two bottles of such and such drink that one bottle will disappear and the other bottle that disappear will be in its place, a, a pack of those pills. And so uh, he's getting it all ready for the night. He's happy. He's smelling himself and everything is going good until until Julio comes and he talks to him and basically tell him, look, it's too much heat. They saw each other being questioned at the same time. He's saying, shut that shit down. No more of that shit is going down in the club until we get this heat up off of us. And that way we protect our own ass and everybody else's in the process. And then as soon as Julio leave, he come up to the other girl. He sends one girl out, the girl that's been fucking with Julio. And then he talks to the other girl that he's been trying to, you know, throw shots at on the side and tell her, hey, business as usual and don't tell nobody especially old girl because you know old girl will tell julio and then dre will be you know fucked up so he's trying to keep it moving but he's trying to be sneaky um we'll see if his gamble pay off in the end but that's the type of shit he's on right now they then show a covert meeting between Greg's last two surviving friends, Sax and his boy from Homeland Security. And they're basically talking and trying to get, you know, a rundown on who Greg was, what was his leads, his positions. The the guy from Homeland is saying, look, Greg thought you was his friend, man. He, he You know he might have did this or that, but he wasn't dirty. You know, we got a tape. Uh, he got it illegally, you know, off the books, but it's got, you know, Tommy admitting to killing, you know, um, Lobos with Ghost, and he's saying, does it say who Ghost is, and this and that, and he's saying, no, but hey, it's got all this good information, why don't you try to get it admitted, maybe we can make something of it, clear Greg's name, nail the bad guys everywhere, everyone walks away happy, Sax is thinking about it, but he don't know what to do. You know, he, he was Greg's friend. And so he's thinking, damn, what can I do to try to make this better? 
Julio meets up with Tommy to let him know, hey, man, the heats came down. The fans didn't pick me up. They picked Dre up. They questioning us. It's a shitload of heat, man. I don't know what the fuck was going on. Tommy, in the meantime, stressing over the new shipment coming in. He's stressing over all kind of shit. And Tommy ain't used to being the number one decision maker, you know, so he, he don't know exactly how to handle it. He trying to tell Julio, thanks for the heads up. Don't worry about it. We're going to make it through. But inside, he's thinking, oh, shit. Damn, Ghost used to really handle this shit like a champ. You know, what am I going to do? I, I can't let everybody down. I got to show that I'm the man. But it ain't easy being the man. Like they say, heavy is the head that wears the crown, right? Now it's time to find out for sure what the OG white gangster is really all about. And he put a bug in Ghost Ear. Hey, you know, you try to be this and you try to be that. But most people, when they come in here, they want to let everybody know who they is. You trying to do the opposite. I can see through that. You know, I know who you are, Ghost. <laughs> and uh he like i don't know who you are he like yeah well why don't i tell uh that chink lawyer mock you know what i know about you and live we'll see what happens and so now he like damn he can't take the chance of bringing no more heat so he like damn well what is all of this about dude drop the bomb that he want this money delivered at such and such times every week or whatever the case and ghost is like what the hell is this all about and now we see, oh boy, ain't nobody to give a damn about him a ghost at all. Or Tommy and ghost at all. He's all about blackmail. And that's the game he's running. And so now ghost mind is spinning. He plays it cool. But, you know, he's always trying to, you know, stay a couple moves ahead. And so then he has to try to play his cards in the hand that he has. And, you know, that's all he has right now. Now, Tommy want to meet with Proctor. He want to hear about what's going on with the case, all the details, what's going on, how is shit turning out. And in the end, Proctor try to reassure Tommy and let him know, hey, man, I ain't got no choice, right? Remember, you said you killed me. And so Tommy like, OK, well, at least he listening to that part. <laughs> so that made Tommy feel better that, hey, the fear of death always keeps somebody working on the up and up. And uh, then before he leave, he say, hey, you got a little something, something for my ex, for my wife, because, uh, you know, she a dope fiend and he been trying to keep her off his ass by giving her a little dope every now and then. And so that's another thing that they got over him that not only could he be killed, but he could be disbarred if they ever was to let him let that out. You know, all the shit that he's got going on. And so he could lose his life, his career, he could lose everything. So that's why he's so deep with these guys. But that's why they are able to be so honest with him, too, because, hey, we all got everything to lose now. You know, you got just as much to lose as we do. You know, we could lose our life. We could lose our career, our freedom. And the same goes for you. So, hey. We all straight up with each other. We all on the level playing field, which is good in a sense, because now he knows when Ghost says he didn't do it, that he actually didn't do it because Ghost has told him about other things that he has done. So, you know, he got nothing to lose. Now the lawyers is talking about ghost case and the black lawyer is starting to question what the hell is Proctor's problem? Why are you believing these dudes so much? Why are you, you know, how are you talking to Tommy last night? Because Proctor tell him, hey, I got some information from Tommy Egan last night. He like, what the fuck are you talking to him for? Well, I used to represent him. Dude, you need to leave the case. You, you, It's a conflict of interest. He's saying, no, both interests is the same. Everything is all good, this and that. He's saying, man, you you're one of the smartest lawyers I know, and you're doing nothing but a bunch of dumb shit. What's going on? He can't come out and say how dirty he is and how they got the upper hand on him and all the shit they've been through and all the dope he getting for his ex and all the shit they got on him and this and that. And so he just say, hey, I know this dude. He innocent. He told me this. I believe him. He innocent. And the black dude is thinking, damn, man, you sounding real dumb right now. But. Nevertheless, he continues to go along with the case, but now he's starting to doubt Proctor. He already had doubts about ghosts. Now he's doubting Proctor's intentions as well. Now Sax, being the good friend that he is to Greg, he's trying to see um, if he can get that, that evidence admitted. 
Um, but he has to do it with a bunch of hypotheticals so that it's not, you know, making himself look guilty of anything or any wrongdoing. And so he's talking to the judge at, you know, this ultra nice, you know, health club or whatever that the judge is at. And they're in this very nice locker room with the judge flat ass flabby body hanging out. And he's trying to talk to him about getting some evidence, you know, that's illegally obtained legally admitted in court and the judge being the stand-up judge that he is i give him credit is saying hell no and not only hell no get the fuck out my face with this shit you're gonna make me look stupid i'm not gonna start ramroading this railroading this dude with a bunch of bullshit evidence and illegally obtained things and you know not only that, you guys are starting to look as suspicious and, and crooked as Proctor suggests. So get out of my face, stay on the up and up, and don't come back to me with any of that crap anymore. And Sax didn't have anything to say except for I'm on my way as fast as I can out of your face. Thanks. Now Ghost meets with Proctor back again at the prison, and he's saying, hey, what's up? I need you to check on this dude. Um, he's, you know basically trying to blackmail me find out what you can and uh i need you to you know give this money to this place in the meantime and proctor saying man what are you talking about is compromise and he's saying hey man it's already too late man dude is saying he's called me by name he's saying this he's saying that you know what what am i supposed to do if he goes and talks to this lawyer or whatever it's gonna make me really look bad so just go ahead see what you can find out, do what you need to do for the meantime, and then we'll decide what the next move is after that. Soon as he finished telling Proctor, you know, what I need you to do and check into, the black lawyer walks in, and that makes him a little more suspicious because he's saying, hey, you started without me? As if in, hey, you got something to hide, you needed to talk to him a little bit first before I got in, so that lets him think it's a little more crookedness going in. And then... In walks Angie. <laughs> Boom. And so now he's thinking, what the hell is she doing in here? And then she wants to talk to him alone, but nobody's falling for that. You know, who knows? He thinks in her mind she may switch this around, not admit this, admit that, whatever the case. And when she comes in, she talks to him in front of his lawyers that, hey, we got a deal. Why don't you admit that you did it? You know, you get life in prison. You spare your kids and your family some more hate, uh, you know, hurt, hurtful times and, you know, everybody can move on. And he's saying, just like she told Greg's friend, I'm not going to admit to something I didn't do. And she's saying, yeah, right. We know when you want something, there's no telling what you won't do. Knowing damn well, she was part of the reason why he was doing all of that shit. She's so full of shit. But anyway, uh, he, he, he says no. She walks away and say, hey, the deal's on the table. Don't take it for granted. And then when she leaves, uh, Proctor's telling him that lit, that deal is a bunch of garbage. And the smooth black lawyer saying, wait a minute. Hey, this you might want to find out more about this deal. And then he's saying she don't have the authority. She can't do this and that, blah, blah, blah. And that makes the black lawyer even more suspicious because he's looking at him like, dude, what the hell is your problem? The shit that he's up against... That might be his only shot. Besides, he's guilty anyway. And so, you know, he what kind of defense attorney thinks you're guilty and still taking your money and representing you? Um, I wouldn't want him as my defense attorney. I would rather want somebody that actually believe I'm not guilty. But I guess that's how the game goes. You know, sometimes you they defend you and take your money. And even though they know that you probably did it. So they half ass defending you, you know, and so. uh that they they kind of conflicted on that and it kind of draws even bigger wedge between proctor and the black lawyer i call him the black lawyer because i didn't catch his name they don't really uh mention him by name too much uh they mentioned his name one time and uh, i forgot it so uh my bad dude by the time angie is done talking with the offer and everything the look on ghost face says it all he's just like oh my fucking goodness i'm in deep doo-doo okay and now i'm like i had to cop to a crime i didn't commit out of everything i've done in my life now i'm gonna go down for some shit i didn't do on some bullshit and i might have to admit to it at that 
just to save my life, even though I'll be in jail for life, and save my family and my kids' life. She kind of even hit them with the, you know, pulling at the heartstrings that if you dead, will your daughter, baby daughter, even remember who you are? And he like, damn. But then what would she want to remember him as? The, the cop killer that's doing life in prison? So, you know, he kind of screwed either way. But, uh, yeah, the look on his face just says it all. Proctor trying to school the, the other lawyer, the black lawyer, and saying, hey, man, this is bullshit. I know it. I know Mock. He wants the glory all for himself. She's up to something sneaky by coming down here by herself. I bet you he didn't even know she did it. Then the black lawyer say, hey, man, if if James is really your client, tell him to turn on Tommy or you need to just leave the case. And so now he like, well, shit, I damn sure can't suggest that because Tommy will kill me. <laughs> and so he like, I ain't gonna never say that one shit. You try to have me killed, bro. Now they're showing Tommy planning a party. Um, we don't know why he's planning a party or what it's all about yet, but he's planning a party. And, of course, he's trying to think like ghosts and have, you know, different plans and schemes in place. And so he's got this big party coming and he got, you know, legit people coming in the front and, you know, crooked in the back. And he got little plans for this and that. No money exchange, but, you know, it's gambling and drinks and all kind of shit going on. And he got this party planned, and uh, we'll see what the party is all about in a little bit. In walks Dre, and he trying to tell Tommy about getting knocked by the police or whatever and getting questioned and what's going on with Julio and how he want him to stop selling dope at the club and everything and how he's saying, hey, I know all this other shit going on, but, uh, man, I got the bottle service on lock. We could still do this shit. Tommy's saying, hey, man, we got to do it. I got too much heat coming from all angles. We need that club money. And so they're going to decide. Uh, Tommy makes the decision. Keep pushing the shit through the club. Fuck what Julio's talking about. And then Dre say, hey, I don't know what happened, but the feds kept Julio a whole lot longer than they kept me. So I don't know. Check your boy. And Tommy say, thanks for the heads up. But I already knew that. Here they show Charlie Murphy. He happily gives Ghost the news of the newspaper of, you know, his daughter crying from that picture that they was taking earlier of her outside of school and saying, hey. It's because of bad parenting. <laughs> Charlie Murphy, man, he was a good guy, man. You can see how skinny the back of his neck is and everything. His 11s was up. So, you know, people, they want to say this and that. It was Illuminati takedown or whatever, Charlie Murphy. But you could clearly see he was sick. Uh, he was a full, you know, bodied man. He was never a skinny dude like that. Then you can see his bone structure of his head, his neck, everything. So it's sad to see him, you know, looking so frail and everything. But it is good to see him, you know, one last time. Um, but in the meantime, back to the story, Ghost, he, he look his, you know, his face, he look about as sick as Charlie Murphy looked once he looks at that paper and see his daughter all over the damn paper and shit and crying and looking bad and shit and he don't know what to do and that just puts more pressure on him to possibly want to take that deal from Angie just because he don't want his kids going through all of that and so much stress and heartache and he wants to end it so it's got his mind and his will spinning about what he should do now they cut to Tariq and he's starting to get instructions on his phone about putting in place the plan, the, the grand plan of 50 Cent, you know, a.k.a. Canaan. And uh, now he's sitting there at his friend's little penthouse apartment playing video games. And now he's, you know, getting the, the info about how to put the plan in place. And man, is he stupid. And the big plan is to be a fucking burglar. <laughs> so he want to go to these high-end apartments and, and penthouses and, and steal shit. Like, it's not it's going to be easy to sell all this expensive shit, Fabergé eggs and all this stuff that these people got. Like, he could just take it to a pawn shop or, like, he could just sell it on eBay or some shit. What a dumbass. Plus, even though Tariq gave him the codes to get into the penthouse, it's going to be obvious that, you know, the only person that could have gave it to him is Tariq. It's going to be obvious that all those elevators got cameras in them. You know, and he's trying to come in with damn shirt like he the maintenance man and the tool belt 
Nigga, they see your ass. You done been to jail. You got a record. They gonna run your pictures. They gonna find you out. You got video when you came into the building. You had to walk past a doorman or some shit. I mean, this plan is just so fake. It's so stupid. He would never be able to get away with it, even if he did get the damn doorman codes. You're not going into those people's house and steal all this shit and get away with it. And what are you gonna sell this shit? Who you know in the hood buying Faberge eggs? Nigga, he, what are you gonna scramble the motherfuckers and make them sunny side up? This shit don't work. It, this this is stupid. This is a stupid ass plan. It's just a small time nigga trying to do big things, and it's just typical what they call nigga shit. Tasha sitting there hugging her daughter, trying to console her about everything that's going on, and in the same time she doing that, she get a call from Ghost, and he want to talk to her and see what's going on, and you know, she's really crying because her face is in the picture, she feels like she messed up, made matters worse, it's her fault, and he want to tell her, you know, of course it ain't your fault, this is, you know, got nothing to do with you, this is my fault, this or that, I'm gonna make it better, you know, don't feel so bad, Tasha frustrated, pissed off, she don't want to hear this shit from this nigga, he didn't left her in the dark way too many times ever since Angie came into the picture, where she kind of fed up with him, and it's kind of sad that he all on his own now, pretty much, um, if it wasn't for Proctor, you know, he'd be screwed, and I'm wondering, how the hell is he even paying Proctor, like, what the fuck, how is he paying this dude, I mean, yeah, he getting money or whatever from the club, but, I'm sure Tasha's sucking that shit up, paying for all their bills, paying for their apartment, this and that. They don't even own that expensive-ass apartment. So, you know, and then they got to pay for the school. They got to pay for so much stuff. Like, where, how is... And then he emptied out their bank account, sold all their stocks and everything. So, I don't know how he affords Proctor and, and that other dude. And I don't know how he's able to do anything. But somehow or another, he's able to do it i mean i guess that's the beauty of television right mike comes and meets greg's friend at the bar and they want to talk about greg's involvement he trying to play the good guy and say hey you know what well, what do you have on greg i uh he talked to me about this and that but i couldn't say it in front of you know mock but um hey why don't you try to get me this evidence or whatever and uh maybe we can work together to try to clear greg's name as well as you know take everybody down and so he's kind of thinking okay cool that sounds good but then when he walks away, you can see he was actually at the bar working on his computer, checking up on Mike as well. So he kind of don't trust nobody at this point. And uh, that's good for him because he's actually talking to the bad guy. Uh, he's the fucking leak and he's the murderer and he's the one that deserves to go to jail. Um, but he's very smart and slick. You know, he never got caught up when he was working with Lobos, and he got away with killing Mike by framing him, putting the phone in the drawer, and then by, you know, planting that gun on Ghost. So we'll see how it all turns out. I'm trying to figure out how in the hell are they going to bust him. The only way they could is if they go to that video for surveillance footage showing him walking into Greg's apartment. I don't know why they didn't do that the night he was killed, but I guess that would have ended a bunch of episodes. So you got to make that money in the end, right, stars? Ghost meets up with Top, uh, Proctor again and finds out about uh, that uh, OG white gangster. His name is Tony Teresi, and he finds out, damn, this dude ain't nobody to be played with. He used to run with these bad group of mobsters and ran a hit squad, killed a lot of big time people. Um, he in big trouble, and you know he ain't nobody to really mess around with. And now Ghost is like, shit. Well. Here, look up under my sleeve, send the money to this address in the meantime, um, and it's a shitload of money every week he got to send, and, you know, we're going to have to try to make do with whatever we can in the meantime until, you know, we can figure out something else, and Proctor don't want to do it, but what, what can he say? He don't have no choice, you know. He's basically just as deep as Ghost and Tommy to a certain level. He ain't killed nobody, but... He knows about it, and, you know, he's crooked and dirty as well. So what What can he do? He, he needs his money, too. 
Now Ghost knows what he's up against. And one last question he want to know is get the details on Angie's deal. I just I need to know. And Proctor tries to talk him out of it. But he want to know, hey, man, how much time, man? Because my daughter and shit is in the papers and it's all your fucking fault. You the one wanted to use the media to, to our advantage. And now it's been reversed. And now my family is at risk. So just find out the details of the deal. Um, I at least need to know that because now they after my kids taking pictures, doing this, doing that. And, and now my name is in the public. That's how this dude knows who the hell I am and all of that. So just just give me the details, man. I'm I'm just I'm pissed right now. Tariq and Raina. Raina comes in his room, try to talk to him about what's going on, why he's snapping, why he acting the way he is, and he basically cuss her out until he get up out of his room. He ain't trying to hear it, and you know she just kind of walk away like, damn, who is this dude? This ain't my brother no more. In the meantime, that's a damn nice entertainment center he got. I like how the sound bar fits in there perfectly and the drawers and the TV. That's really nice. Um, that's probably a couple thousand for that right there. And that's what he got in his room. He don't even understand how fortunate he is Why he mad at his dad like his dad did him so wrong. I mean, I can understand he mad about the cheating and stuff or whatever, but... You know, when you get older, I guess you understand that that don't have thing to do with the kids. Um, it was more of something that he had between him and the mom. But as the kid, I guess he heard that, hey, you did that to my mom. Like, damn, I guess you, that's how much you care about us, that you do that to my mom. So, you know, a kid looks at it different because um, they look at the mom and the dad differently than as a husband and wife would look at each other. Um, but, uh, in the long run, he, he tripping, he's sitting in a couple hundred dollar game chair. He got all type of things that he want. He's spoiled, but, but he's spoiled. So he don't realize how fortunate he has it. And that a nigga like 50 cent ain't doing nothing, but using him and jealous. He don't even know he had a gun to the back of his head. If he didn't say what he said, he'd already be dead. So he, he just a big dummy all the way around. But unfortunately i got a feeling that before this season is over he gonna realize the hard way uh what's really going on they cut to a little preliminary hearing and uh proctor the the black lawyer came through he found the missing evidence about the traffic stop proctor presented it to the court the judge said hey we're not gonna throw out the dna but we will allow the traffic evidence. So Mock now has a you know choice: either you take it off and we'll take off the, the traffic stop, or you leave it on and we'll leave on the traffic stop. And so then he takes off the DNA evidence, and then they take off the traffic stop. So now that was a somewhat of a win for the prosecution. I mean, for the defense, because now they can't say we got DNA evidence and the weapon. Now they can only say they found the weapon, which his fingerprints ain't on because he never touched that damn gun. So I wonder how that's going to all work out. We'll see. But uh, it looked like Mike case is getting a little flimsy mike got a little shitty when they had that traffic evidence and then the judge the one way that they got it all thrown out is that the judge they said hey it's not that easy judge because the prosecution knew about it miss valdez knew about the traffic stop and she didn't they didn't admit it so either they either you know like the judge say either they were being crooked and trying to you know railroad this dude and set him up or it was negligence either way they wrong so you gotta drop it and so now they, they don't have the dna on him turns out tommy is actually getting a little smart you gotta give it up to him um part of the party was just a distraction it seems um he he had a feeling or whether he knew he was being watched or tailed um it shouldn't be that hard to guess it's so obvious he's been told by numerous people but nevertheless um the party was a distraction and he used this uh vehicle as a way to get out of the party without being tailed so that he can get to where he was going and he may use this vehicle to go right back to the party and then walk out the party as if he was there the whole night which would be pretty smooth if that's what he did but nevertheless maybe that party was all a big distraction at the same time uh keeping people entertained so that they stay and make sure his distraction stays the whole night good job tommy 
Mark comes to Angie's office to apologize about, you know, not taking the traffic stop more serious when she gave it to him. I guess he was thinking he was all that and a bag of snacks and he didn't need to hear from her, but only so much. And now they ended up being a big fuck up. Now they can't use that DNA evidence. And so now the case is getting a little weaker by the moment. All they got is fingerprints on the window and the gun, but his gun has no fingerprints on it. So they reviewed the cameras at Truth on the night in question. They can see the ghost never went into that area and put the gun there. See, they're not using all the surveillance video footage properly in these episodes, man. But I guess if they did, this, like I say, the episode would be over. They'd have to come up with more creative writing. And I guess it's already hard enough to write these type of shows. And they do a good job. So I give them credit on that. But. In the end, uh, Angie is put back on the team, and she thinks, yeah, that's right, I'm the shit. You need to put me back on the team. I am the MVP. I'm the most valuable. You need me. That's how her little facial expression was after he kissed her ass about how he fucked up. Now, the episode ends with the black lawyer having a one-on-one with Ghost. Ghost starts off saying, thanks for, you know, finding the evidence. I appreciate it. And do say, hey, man, I'm just doing my job. No problem, man. But in the end, I'm not here because I think, you know, you're an innocent or a good guy. I'm here because I'm doing my job. Now, you know, you had all these advantages. You're smart. You could do this. You do that. But you're still a bad dude, and you still ended up where you deserve to be. And Ghost is looking at him like, wait a minute, nigga, hold up. You you really think you know me? Like, dude, you the one with all the advantages. Yeah, he do think he Ghost had the advantages because he had money and different things. And dude, Ghost is like, dude, you had the advantages. You had a stable background, a nice home, two parents, you know, a house full of books and, you know, opportunities for good schools and shit. You the one with the advantage. Don't come at me with that. And stop coming at me like you know me so well and I'm so guilty, man. Don't don't do that, man. You you don't you don't do that. Yeah, man, I, I ain't the one, man. And so Ghost kind of let a little his, uh, you know, veil slip and kind of let dude know, hey, man, fuck you, man. I ain't the one, you know what I'm saying? You know, you think I'm guilty and I'm this and I'm that. But in the end, you know, you, you really don't know me, man. You, you really don't know me. And so um, don't 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 assume I'm just such a bad dude or I'm this or I'm that and I'm guilty and I belong here because you got me twisted. And dude is saying, yeah, whatever, dude, I know you, I didn't been around the block, I I know who I'm talking to, and in the end, they both are right, actually, you know, Ghost is a bad dude, but in life, it's not so simple, Um, just like I tell my son, it's not as simple as good or bad, it's a lot of shades of gray, like they say, 50 shades of gray, that's a real title, it's a lot of shades of gray in life, and so, Ghost is kind of in the middle. He's a good guy and does a lot of good, but on the other side, he does a whole lot of bad as well. He's a drug dealer. He has people killed, and he's killed people himself. But then on the other side, he loves his family. He takes care of his kids. He's helped out people like Dre, Julio, get out the street, and other people saved uh, the Scarface chick life um, because Tommy wanted her killed and other things, you know. But you know where is he really what is he really a good guy a bad guy somewhere in between i mean what is he it's hard to tell and this dude you know he's right he you know ghost is right about him you know he did have advantages coming from a stable home you know opportunities to go to the right schools different things and you know a a better chance of success in life Whereas Ghost's father died young, at a, well, he was still young, um, he, he was kind of raised poor in the hood, you know, people he looked up to was dope dealers that was making money, and that's what he kind of gravitated towards. He was a smart kid and all, but it was only so much he could do, you know, without opportunities for going to college or going away and things. So in the end, they kind of look at each other and say, yeah, I know you. Yeah, I know you. But they both are right and they both are wrong. It's going to be interesting to see how this dynamic plays out. 
Is this lawyer going to come around to see and help Ghost and believe him more? Or is Ghost and him going to have more friction? Possibly even Ghost wanting to fire his ass. Or maybe dude, well, he got attorney-client privilege, so he can't just turn on him and then testify against him. So, I mean, um, who knows how things will turn out. But it's definitely worth watching. And uh, this episode didn't have as much as the last episode but um, it's, it was kind of like a courtroom drama this episode almost. But uh, it was still good. And so I'm um, looking forward to seeing the next one. Y'all like, subscribe, and I'll see you on the next episode. Peace.